Well, welcome to everybody that's joining now. We'll just give it a few more minutes for other people to join in. I do make it one o'clock, but we'll just give it a few more minutes. Um, it's rather strange to be sat here and talking to myself, apparently, but I understand there are about 500 people joining us, so that, that's rather wonderful. So just to run through a, through a few housekeeping things before we start, um, my name's Dr. Trevor Dines, uh, and I'm hosting the webinar today. Uh, I'm my co-host uh, is Dr. Kate Petty. Hello, Kate. Uh, she is our Road Verge manager um, and campaign manager, and she'll be hosting her own talk tonight at six o'clock uh, about Road Verges. Unfortunately, that one is also fully booked, but all these webinar webinars will be made available, uh, will be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel and social media channels uh, afterwards. So you can catch up with Kate later if you've not been able to uh, uh, book onto her, her talk. Um, if you have questions, as it says here, we can't actually see you, so um, which is really odd for me because I love to see the audience and love to interact with the audience. Uh, so uh, this is a new experience for me. Uh, during the webinar, we can't see or hear you, but please use the Q&A button that you should have at the bottom of the screen to ask questions about the content of the webinar as we go through. Now, Kate will be fielding and looking, collating the questions as we go through but you won't be able to see them so we can oh, we'll have a little question and answer session at the end and that's when we'll deal with with the questions that have been posted if you've got a question about zoom itself and something with functionality working pop that into the chat function um and we've got a little team behind screens that's uh, sort of helping with that in case anything goes wrong but hopefully it won't um uh, kate's also going to drop a few things into the chat a bit of extra information about the talk as we go through uh which is wonderful and um, we've also got uh, our social media guys behind the scenes. Archie will be uh, tweeting using uh, the hashtag um, Spring Into Action and Meadow Makers as well. So if you're on Twitter, uh, you can keep an eye out uh, for things that are happening. So a warm welcome to everybody to the second of our, our seminars entitled in the series Spring Into Action. Uh, and we just thought, you know, this is such a, a, a sort of, um, a time of year when everybody needs a little bit of cheering up. So I'm going to fill your screens basically with flowers and sunshine for the next hour as I take you on the journey uh, through meadow creation that I've been involved with for the last five years. Um, have a look at the Plant Life website. There's lots of other uh, webinars and um, <clears throat> workshops that we're hosting throughout the rest of the month. So trying to make February a little bit of an exciting and interesting thing to look forward to for the rest of the month. So uh, the webinar today is Creating a Meadow in the Conway Valley. Uh, I should have subtitled this really, How to Get Nine Million Flowers in Five Years. Uh, that's really what we're, we're looking at. And it's the personal story, my personal story, of how I went about creating a meadow and uh, uh, the, the, the results that we've had. Uh, so for those of you that don't know uh, about plant life, haven't heard of plant life before, we are a plant conservation charity, wild plant conservation charity, working hard, as we say, to keep the colour in the countryside uh, and speaking up for wild plants of all kinds. Uh, we've got about 70 members of staff around the UK and our HQ is in Salisbury in Wiltshire. As you can see, it's quite a big office with a very pointy roof and an awfully big heating bill in the winter. Um, <laughs> this is Salisbury Cathedral, very famous, of course. Uh, but I love going down to Salisbury to our HQ because it's actually where we're from, where I'm from originally. I am um, grew up on a farm just outside Salisbury, uh, well, across the border in Hampshire, uh, just near a village called Stockbridge in the Test Valley. Uh, so I had, a, as I was growing up, a botanical playground, really, of incredible diversity with fields, woods and water meadows full of absolutely incredible, rare and interesting plants to find. I was uh, uh, scouting around the fields and mapping in my head all of these plants before I was age 13. Mm, there we go. That says a lot about me, doesn't it? Uh, 
when I then moved from there to the <clears throat> moved away from my farming farming groups up to the uh, dramatic landscapes of the Snowdonia Mountains in North Wales, uh, I came to university in Bangor, which had a, a wonderful botany department there at that time. And after completing my PhD in botany and a, a small project mapping all of the plants in Britain and Ireland uh, for the Botanical Society of the British Isles, I began working for Plant Life back in 2001. So I've been with Plant Life for nearly 20 years now. And Plant Life owns 23 nature reserves around the UK. Most of these are grasslands and meadows, uh, which we bought up uh, from some funding, or we helped with some funding from Timothy at the time. If anybody remembers the Timothy advert uh, with a, uh, a lady in a, in, a, in, a, in a sunlit meadows just stroking her hair like this, sunlight filtering through, uh, that was Timothy. They were promoting their, their, their shampoo. And Timothy actually is, is Finnish for Timothy grass. Uh, so there's a little botanical con connection there, but they gave Plant Life a generous grant at the beginning to help us buy up some of these meadows. And this is one of my favorites on the screen now is Kayatanabulch Reserve on the hill uh, above Klonogvaur, just outside Carnarvon, a few miles from where I live. Uh, this is owned by Plant Life, uh, managed with us uh, for us by the uh, North Wales Wildlife Trust. It's absolutely one of my favorite places on a glorious summer's day. Uh, there are something like, oh, just around seven or 8,000 butterfly, greater butterfly orchids in these meadows. And we have a lovely time every year um, counting the butterfly orchids and, and monitoring the vegetation there. And this is really where my love affair uh, with meadows really began in this reserve here. And it really is a love affair. For many of us, this is the sort of embodiment of, of a wildflower meadow, a soft, dreamy flowerscape backlit with sunlight and just that idyllic idea uh, of a field full of flowers. And of course, in other cases, these can be thousands of orchids. If you've ever been to Jones Hill Nature Reserve, Plant Life's Reserve in Herefordshire, hundreds upon thousands of, 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 of orchids flowering in the, in the meadows there. And then there are other very different meadows, of course, as well. Up in Yorkshire, you'll find these wonderful sea of flowers in Muca Meadows, one of my favourite sets of meadows, 12 meadows uh, set up in Swaledale, and very iconic species like this wood cranes bill in the foreground here, uh, uh, very reminiscent of these northern uh, hay meadows. But of course, this idyllic picture, as we all know, is sadly no longer as common as it once was. And back in the 1930s, this is largely down to a chap called George Stapleton. He was the director of the Welsh Plant Breeding Institute at Aberystwyth. He took a very low view of these, of these flower-rich pastures. He actually described them, and I'm quoting here, as some of the worst examples of slovenly, negligent, and deplorable husbandry in the whole of agriculture. Uh, yes, that's not how I would describe them, but he recommended that every pasture would like this in, in the country would benefit from uh, being ploughed up and reseeded coincidentally using the new strains of, of ryegrass and clover that he helped develop. And unfortunately, his view became government policy, driving production and driving productivity in these meadows. So that by 1945, just a short time after he started advocating this, 40% of our flower rich pastures and meadows had been ploughed. Even today, these processes of ploughing, reseeding, fertilising, cutting regularly for silage and grazing hard throughout the year are very much the accepted norm. So that today we have lost 97% of our wildflower meadows and they've been largely replaced with scenes like this intensive pasture dominated with perennial ryegrass, white clover and with less than maybe a dozen other sort of species, weedy species growing within that, that um, field, uh, things like docks and clover. Um, so 45% of our meadows have gone to that, 43% uh, have been uh, converted to arable, uh, past, uh, arable croplands uh, growing with wheat and barley. Uh, and this is, this is in fact one of the fields where, where I grew up on the farm where I grew up uh, uh, down, down in Hampshire. Uh, and these cereal monocultures again just will have just a dozen species of, of, of highly competitive plants that can survive in that, that environment. 
The other main loss of these meadows has been to uh, woodland and scrub. Uh, and this is often the result uh, of, of, uh, of a lack of management. So 3% of, of, of these pastures have been lost. That gradual development of scrub, and that develop, gradual development of woodland. You know, that in front of us on the screen now is an absolutely fantastic, fabulous species rich habitat. But if there isn't any management there, that scrub will slowly take over and it will convert to high woodland. And that's where we've lost another 3% of these meadows. So the result, as I mentioned, is that over 97% of our species rich grassland and meadows have been destroyed. And that's a really difficult figure to get your head around. Um, we've worked out that uh, 7.5 million acres have disappeared. And to put that into perspective, that is an area equal to 1.5 times the size of Wales. Uh, if you scattered that area uh, across the whole, whole of Britain, that's what we've lost in, in, in Wildflower Meadow. And in response to that, you know, plant life has been campaigning uh, for years about uh, the loss of meadows. And back in 2012, we published a report, Our Vanishing Flora, which looked at the loss of species, the loss of plants, the loss of flowers from individual counties and, and vice counties a, a, a across the UK. Now, in the foreword to the report, uh, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, who's our patron, uh, called for in the year of his mother's coronation, a concerted effort to create a new meadow in every county. And that is where the idea of coronation meadows was born. So the Coronation Meadows project is led by Plant Life, uh, and we're working in partnership with the Wildlife Trusts and the Rare Breed Survival Trust, who are uh, both have uh, Prince Wales as their, as their patrons. And it's a wonderful, wonderful partnership to, to, to work together. The Wildlife Trust owning many of these, these, these uh, fragments of, of species rich grasslands that are left, but also the Rare Breed Survival Trust bringing to us a whole raft of expertise and knowledge uh, and, and uh, understanding of how these meadows work and how they, they should be grazed that we hadn't really sort of uh, uh, had access to before. So it's wonderful to work in, in partnership with them. Now the idea behind Coronation Meadows is really quite beautifully simple. Uh, the, uh, the aim is to identify a, an ancient uh, Coronation Meadow, an old meadow, one in each county, and then to collect seed from that meadow to create new Coronation Meadows in the county nearby. This is a process of natural seeding and this forms the core of, of, of the work of, of Coronation Meadows. So this natural seeding helps convert, conserve the variation and the local character of our meadows. You know, if you go to, this is, this is again, uh, Jones Hill Reserve uh, in Herefordshire. This Herefordshire meadow will look very, very different from a meadow that's found in Carmarthenshire or up in Cumbria or across in Norfolk. So these meadows have their own species, their own identities, and natural seeding is, is a way of preserving that when we create the new meadows. So these ancient coronation meadows are sort of flagship meadows for their county, like say one in each county. They're flower rich, uh, permanent grasslands maintained by traditional agricultural processes. And they tend to have a very long history of the same management going back um, often generations. All of them are accessible to the public and uh, all of them, like I say, have been used as a source of seed to create new meadows in the same county. Uh, so around uh, the county, uh, around the country now, we've got 88 of these ancient coronation meadows identified, uh, and each one has a, has these wonderful little roundels that we had great fun putting up and getting people that are involved in their meadows to send in these lovely little uh, photos of, of them displaying the fact that their 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 uh, uh, meadows were coronation meadows. But the real focus of the project, as I've mentioned, is meadow creation and using these meadows to create new ones. 91 new meadows have now been created in 60 counties across Eng England and Wales as part of the project. Uh, and in total, that's two th over 2,000 acres of new meadow, uh, which is an absolute wonderful contribution to, to, to that that's been lost. So I was, I've been sort of part of the Coronation Meadows project from its very inception, uh, uh, and working with, with the project team and, and, the, and the landowners and the farmers and, and delivering this, this on the ground. And during the course of the project, uh, we moved home. 
uh, in North Wales. And we were lucky enough to uh, buy a little place in the Conway Valley, which is a beautiful setting up in North, North Wales. Um, and in front of the house were a couple of fields. Uh, it's a rather spectacular setting. Like you can see, the River Conway is there in front of us and behind that is the this sort of uh, the, the end of the Carn uh, range of mountains covered in snow as it is at the, at the moment. And these fields in front of the house, they'd been um, looked after quite sympathetically by the owners before us, but they had been, um, like so many pastures, grazed quite heavily with horse grazing in this case uh, for many, many years. So that had led to these pastures, the, the, this, these fields being really, really grass rich rather than flower rich. So this is where we started uh, back in 2015. However, we were really, really lucky that no fertilizer had been applied to these fields for at least 40 years. Um, so the soil wasn't packed with uh, nutrients. It wasn't very fertile. And this then gave us an ideal starting po point to create a new wildflower meadow. If anybody's thinking of, of, of starting a new wildflower meadow, soil fertility is the one thing that you have to look at right at the very beginning and make sure that it's not very, very high. So back in 2015, as part of the Coronation Meadows project, uh, we uh, used natural seeding techniques to bring the seed here from our county Coronation Meadow, a place called Moss Hill, down the valley uh, and create a new meadow. So how did we go about it? Well, the first step was back in August 2015 to take a quite a hard cut of the hay, mowing the long grass and then baling that up and removing that from the field, from the fields. And here you can see these are our two fields, uh, the top one, which I'll explain a little bit more about it in a moment, and then the lower one down by the river, which is the, the, the Coronation Meadow itself. So once we'd cleared the fields, got the hay crop off, um, we bought in a very special piece of tech, bit of equipment, um, and this is what's called a Rytec flail mower. Now, other brands of flail mower are available, uh, but this is a, a Rytec fly, flail mower. And flail mowers, if people are sort of familiar with a hedge cutter, this is almost like a hedge cutter laid on its side. So it's got a flail of, of, of blades uh, in the tractor along there. And um, uh, they, they, that goes along the, the surface of the soil and it strips off the top of the grass and the thatch that's built up over the years. If you look in any field, in any pasture that's been grazed and mown for a long time, you'll often find this thick thatch of, 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 of built up dead vegetation on top of the soil, which sort of acts as a barrier for seed getting down to the soil. So you can see how this Rytec is going across the field and removing that layer of grass and thatch and leaving some quite large areas of, of bare earth showing, but it's not actually churning up the soil. It's not disturbing that soil profile, releasing carbon, getting weeds to germinate. It just strips off that top surface. Um, if you were to if you were to sow seed on the right hand side of this screen, it would find soil and germinate. Sow seed onto the left hand of the screen, uh, it would just sit on the surface of the soil and, and, and not disappear. Uh, you can't imagine the amount of material this <laughs> removed off the field. And that was one thing that the one lesson that I learned very quickly was plan where all this material is going before you start. Um, the chap went down the field and then back up and then basically said, Governor, where do you want all this material to go? Uh, we hadn't decided that at all. So there's now still in the bottom corner of, of that picture there, a rather large rotting pile of, of, of vegetation um, uh, in the corner of that field, which is where all these, all these clippings went. Um, but after that Rytec went over the field, we then followed that up with a, a harrow to further open up the soil, create these, these, these tines going down into soil, removing some more of that vegetation and really opening up the soil. So by the end of the day, the whole field looked like this. Um, you're aiming for about 50%, at least 50% bare earth being visible at the end of this process. And in fact, the harder what we've learned through experience is that the harder you hit the, the site at the beginning of this process, the better, the more bare soil you can, you can create, the better uh, the establishment afterwards. So we got around 50, 60% bare earth visible on the soil. And then the next day we were ready to bring in the seed uh, from down the valley. So down the valley is Moss Hill. 
uh, Moss Hill uh, in near Penmachno is the coronation meadow for Conway. It's owned by the National Trust and managed by them. And this is where the seed from our coronation meadow came from. Now, there are few places that I've visited as a botanist that have been so breathtaking as, as Moss Hill. It's a small site, it, 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 it's, it's a rocky site, it's an uneven site but it has the most spectacular display of devil bit scabious that I've ever seen. Um, it was just a sea of blue in the summer. And honestly, I wish I could have recorded this and, and played this now, the sound from the bees uh, and the hoverflies and the other insects from here on a summer's day is absolutely astonishing. As well as the devil's bit scabious, there's all sorts of other flowers in there like red clover, birds for trefoil, there's even some ladies mantle, some beautiful betony, and Burnet Saxfridge as well. So it's a very, very rich site. So we took seed from there and also from a neighboring field on the other, literally on the other side of the road called Tinacoid um, Meadows. And these provided us with a few other species as well, lots more oxide daisy, there was lots more yellow rattle in this site and a lot of eyebright as well. So we, we took seed from both sites to bring into our meadow. So as I said, we'd prepared the site on the first day and then the next day, we took a green cut of hay from the meadows. Now this is literally freshly cut hay, uh, which arrives uh, in a little trailer in this case. Some people bale it up, uh, but we left it fresh like this and it arrived at our meadow the next day. Now this, this has got all of that seed inside it. This is, this is sort of uh, you know, a, a really rich mixture of, of hay full of that seed. And the idea is to get it to the meadow and spread it out on the meadow as quickly as possible. Uh, any of you that are gardeners know that as soon as you throw this sort of material onto a compost heap, it starts heating up and it can literally cook the seeds inside. So you want to get it spread out onto the, the, field, the prepared field as quickly as possible. A little digger to lift it up there. And we actually put it onto, into, loaded it into a muck spreader. And this muck spreader then went up and down the field, spreading this hay across the field. It did a really good job of it. The contractors that we had inside uh, in to do this work for us, Kehoe Countryside, they're real experts at doing this and they know how to drive the tractor at the right speed, gently across the field and, and get a nice and even spread of hay across the field. We also used a second technique of natural seeding, and this is to use a brush harvester. Uh, and this was driven around on the back of a, a little ATV, all terrain vehicle. And this is a little, basically a little sort of tine operated is in the back there. There's a, there's a drum with some tines on it, which go around and flick the seed up into a hopper at the back. And you get a different sort of uh, profile of seeds coming out from this way. And you can also do this to a standing crop of vegetation. So you can do this to a site two or three times throughout the summer and get different species seeding. And this sort of collection leads to sort of dumper bags of this really seed rich material. You get less vegetation, uh, sort of green grass and uh, sorry, green leaves and, and, and stems in there. It's packed full of seed. And the best way to spread this is to uh, do that by hand and literally just get spread that on, on, out onto, onto the field. So we got friends and family involved for a day spreading that out onto the fields at, 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 at our, at our uh, new meadow. So by the end of, the, of those two days of work, the clearing and then the spreading the seed, this is what our, our soil, this is what the whole field looked like. It was absolutely amazing. We had an awful lot of seed there and you can see, just make out the seed, if I can just uh, uh, pick up the, uh, so it, that, those sort of disc shaped seeds in the middle there, the brown seeds, that, that's yellow rattle seed uh, and there's little bits of uh, devil's bit scabious seed in there and some grass seeds as well but that's how the seed looked across the meadow and then we had a really wonderful this was back in 2015 a really wonderful wet warm uh, few weeks after that which just proved perfect for germination and uh, I quickly became uh, a, sort of a bit of an expert at trying to identify different species as they germinated um, so millions of seedlings started at Oh, goodness gracious, the, the, yeah, the excitement at this stage, I spent every day rushing out and trying to see what was germinating. Uh, things like common sorrel, 
on the, on the left, top right, in, in the middle, we've got devil, devil's bit scabious, uh, glowing cockwise, uh, oxide daisy, uh, then um, knapweed and uh, meadow buttercup in, in, in the middle at the bottom there. So these little seedlings started to appear and that was just so exciting, such, a, such an exciting period to actually see, yeah, this had worked, the, the natural seeding had, had taken place and these plants had, had arrived in, this, in the field and were starting to germinate. But if you remember back to the, the Ritec flail mower and what that was doing to the field, it was only taking off the top layer of soil. It wasn't going down into the soil. It wasn't removing the grass roots that were there. So the grass grows back really, really quickly. So as well as the seedlings, you get the grass coming back. And in just a couple of weeks, this is how the field looked. Almost no different from any other improved sort of field uh, growing around. Uh, this very vigorous growth of grass coming back. And then we often show this slide to uh, people that are undergoing, that are going through this process of, of, of seeding, natural seeding, because you know, to a farmer, it can be quite horrific you <laughs> stripping off all of their grass and, and then they get quite nervous about uh, the damage that you're doing to the field. But look, this is what happens after a couple of weeks time, all of that vegetation comes back. You haven't got a lot of bare earth exposed to the, to, to the elements. Uh, this is literally a couple of weeks later and it looks like a, a, a green field. But of course that presents us with a problem because we've got all of those seedlings germinating and this grass is very vigorous and will compete and overshadow and, and displace those, those seedlings. So we need something in here to, uh, to keep that grass under control uh, and, to, and to allow those seedlings to germinate. Um, so there's an old adage that livestock make meadows and meadows make livestock. So we decided to uh, uh, take the plunge and buy our own uh, livestock for the field. And by chance, the chap that, one of the guys that uh, looks after Moss Hill, the National Trust place where the seed came from, uh, he keeps Highland cattle. So we bought our own Highland cattle. And this is uh, Caddy and Brea, uh, our two little heifers as they were at the time, arriving in their new home. This is, this is just as they arrived. Um, and uh, so they only traveled just down the valley uh, and were brought in to, to, to graze the meadow as it grew back. And they have done an absolutely fantastic job. This is them in that year. Uh, <laughs> they, 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 were, they couldn't quite believe their eyes. They were the only two cattle in this field and they had this whole field to graze. Um, and uh, Geraint, who uh, sold them to us, you know, he describes them as little barrels these days. <laughs> they really did get fat on, on that regrowth of grass. But Highland cattle are very, very hardy. They're very, very adaptable. They're very easy to look after. And they did a fantastic job staying out all winter and keeping the grass down. Now, just to explain how our system works, I mentioned we had two fields. Uh, this top pasture, this grazing pasture at the top is where the cattle cutting brea stay during the spring and the summer. Um, so it's almost, some people describe it as a sacrificial pasture. You know, we don't expect a lot of flowers growing in there, but they're contained in that area, as I say, whilst the meadow grows and flowers. And then when we've taken the hay cut in the meadow uh, late in, in the year, uh, the cattle come out of the grazing pasture and down into the meadow. And this little two field system really works well for us. Um, if you're small holders like us, uh, it can be easily accommodated. Um, uh, it's nice to have that, that other little bit of grazing available for, for your cattle whilst they're not in the meadow. And then the meadow provides a, a huge amount of hay for us to feed the cattle over, over the winter when, when feeding gets short. So it's a little two field system that, that works really, really nicely. And the system that we're slipping into now is a, a sort of traditional pattern of hay meadow management. So, like I say, during spring and summer, um, the cattle are out of the field and we just leave it alone. We just let it do its thing in all its glorious you know, abundance uh, from the spring flowers through to the, the summer flowers, the knapweed and, and, the, and the ragwort at the, at the very end of the year. Uh, so that's uh, sort of spring and summer all the way through that. There's no grazing in the meadow. And then in August or September, we take a cut of hay um, and collect the, the, the round bales from the, from the field. Um, uh, that's done by a local contractor for us and they then go into storage. And then a couple of weeks after that hay cut has been taken, that grass regrows again. It's called the aftermath growth. 
So again, you bring in grazing animals to keep that aftermath growth nice and short. And of course, in this case, uh, we're using Highland cattle uh, and we normally have three to five cows. Often we have a couple uh, more from Garrett and Larry's fold where, where, where the cows came from. So we graze that quite hard in, 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 in the autumn. Uh, September through to February, we're quite lucky because uh, although we live in wet northwest Wales, uh, these fields here are, are fairly well drained down into the uh, down into the River Conway at the, at the bottom. So we don't have too many problems with poaching uh, and the ground getting too cut up over the winter. So we can leave the cattle out till, till February. And what we're aiming for is, is this really, really short turf that's packed full of species. Now, my experience over the last few years is that this is of fundamental importance. This hard grazing at this period is fundamentally important to uh, keeping the species increasing, keeping the species richness in these in these meadows, because this is probably the main germination period of, of all of these plants. And this is when you want that grazing in place to keep that sward short and allow those seedlings to germinate and and give room for the plants to grow. So this this autumn to winter spring germination period is absolutely fundamental if you want to increase species diversity within your fields. That takes us through to February. And by February, by the end of February, uh, the first yellow rattle seedlings are starting to germinate. Now, uh, yellow rattles are a really important species within the meadow because it taps into the roots of grasses and other plants as well, suppressing their growth almost by about 60% in some cases and creating room for the wildflowers to, 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 to grow. So this germination of, of yellow rattle is, 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 is always, uh, is always <laughs> go out uh, sort of from a couple of weeks time uh, in the middle of February to the end of February, uh, sort of you know, scanning the turf and waiting for the first yellow rattle seedlings to germinate. Um, they're lovely little things, often called, they've got little rabbit ears uh, with their first little leaves that start showing. And I use this as a, as a, as a biological, biological indicator of timing to take the cattle out of, uh, out of the field. So it's at this point, once the yellow rattle germinate, that we sort of shut up the meadow, as the old term is, remove the cattle up into that top pasture, and then leave the meadow to do its thing through spring and summer. So that's the sort of cycle that we've adopted through the years. So 2015, this is how the meadow looked. Um, as you can see, dominated here by Yorkshire fog, uh, with scattering of nettles and docks and just a few meadow buttercups through. Um, there were species there. You know, it wasn't species. There was, there was a bit of knapweed. There was a bit of um, uh, bird's foot trefoil and other things in there. But it was dominated, as you can see here, by grasses, uh, particularly York, Yorkshire fog. So that was uh, where we started from. So the year after seeding, this is how the meadow looked. And as you can see, there's still a lot of grass in here, still a lot of Yorkshire fog. But there are a few flowers starting to come through, a few more buttercups than there were before. Uh, there was a little bit of yellow rattle, but not very much. And this first year after you start the work, people can get a little bit disheartened and think it hasn't worked. Just you wait. So you need to wait a couple of years for the yellow rattle to get going. And this first year of seeding puts a huge amount of seed back into the meadow. So the year after this, 2017, this same view looked like this. This is what I call my explosion of yellow rattle. Um, it was absolutely dominant in, in the meadow. It really took a grip uh, and went through the sward, really suppressed the grass. <clears throat> To be honest, there was hardly any room for anything else in the meadow at all. Uh, and the grass was very visibly reduced in, 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 in growth. So that did its thing and, and got on top of that grass and reduced the growth. The next year, we really started to get a sort of proper wildflower meadow starting to develop. And this was that big transformation. So here you can see the red, yellow rattle in the sward but many more flowers coming in, lots more uh, buttercups, lots more uh, red clover, a little bit of cat's ear coming in and lots of yellow, uh, lots of common sorrel coming in. Uh, this was the point where I sort of, uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, this is where I started crying and thinking, good grief, this is, you know, we have, we have achieved a, a wildflower meadow. By 2018, it was really starting to look like a proper wildflower meadow and uh, the transformation has just been astonishing. 
2019, it got even better, even more flowers, uh, even less grass, even more um, uh, uh, different species coming in. And uh, this was the year, This I call this the year of, of cat's ear. So cat's ear completely dominated the sward. And I think this is because we actually had a bit of a drought in 2018. <clears throat> and in 2019, cat's ear, which is the little yellow, the, 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 the dandelion looking flower that dominates here. Uh, that's got quite a long taproot and was able to, to survive the drought fairly, fairly well. So that really dominated in 20, 2018. Uh, sorry, in 2019. And then last year in 2020, the meadow just got off to a fantastic start, a really lovely mixed sward developing. And this really looks starting to look like an authentic uh, wildflower meadow at this stage. Or at least it did until the drought hit. And if you remember back last year, um, that drought where we had no rain or absolutely no rain in sort of, I think it was March, April and May, one of the most severe droughts on, 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 on record. So a few weeks after I took this photo, the meadow basically looked like that. Now I'll come back to this in a minute because this has had loads of effect, knock on effects for, for what the meadow uh, looks like and, and how it performed. Now I've been doing lots of uh, monitoring in the meadow uh, using highly scientific uh, equipment, uh, basically uh, uh, a load of uh, canes laid out on, <laughs> in a square. Uh, so I use these one meter quadrats to do uh, detailed uh, uh, vegetation monitoring. And every each one of these one meter squares is divided into nine separate cells. And basically you count uh, and record uh, every species within those cells. And that gives you uh, an idea of the not only the, the, the presence, but the abundance and frequency of these species within the meadow. That's repeated 21 times across the meadow, it takes two days of, of backbreaking work, um, but it's a lovely place, to, <laughs> lovely office to work in. Uh, and that's over the years has built up into a really detailed picture of what's happening in, in the meadow. So overall, the number of species recorded in each of one, each one of those one meter quadrats has gradually increased. So we started off, like I said, at not too bad a, a starting point of nearly 18 species per meter. That's now increased up to 27 species per meter this year. So we're heading up to those high figures um, of, of real species richness. So that's 27.1 species within just a square quadrat at your feet. Even more impressive are the total number of species recorded in, in the meadow. And you can see that we started with nearly 50 at the beginning back in 2015. And this year in 2020, we're nearly up to 100 species being recorded in the meadow. So we've effectively doubled the species richness. Uh, and, and as you can see, it's starting to level off. And that's what you would expect as well. A, a big increase at the beginning and then a slower tailing off, but a constant addition of new species in, into the meadow uh, each year. Um, so that's something that, that will happen in the future. We'll constantly get new species coming in. And of course, it's a flux of species. So other species are, are disappearing uh, as, as the meadow establishes and changes. Now we can track individual species as well. I don't want you to take in all of the detail of this slide, but I just wanted to, to point out these are, are sort of positive indicators, things, nice things in the meadow that we want to have there. And you can see how, for example, things like um, uh, uh, yellow rattle has increased, red clover, that red line has, has increased gradually through the years. Cats here has really, really increased as well. Um, and uh, uh, the only one that hasn't really sort of taken off, um, and that surprised me, is common bird's foot trefoil. It's sort of um, sort of you know, wiggling along the bottom there, uh, not really increasing, but it's still there and it's there in the sward. And I think it just takes a little bit more time to, to get going. But as you'll notice last year or this, or, or, or this last year, uh, because of the drought, you'll notice that there are big crashes in yellow rattle, um, the green line at the top, eye bright, the next green line down, and then that darkish blue line of lesser trefoil. Now these are all annual species in the meadow. They germinate every year in the spring and these are the ones that were hardest hit by the drought this year, uh, last year. So these tiny little annuals germinated in February uh, and then almost had no water until, until May. So a lot of them died off. The yellow rattle died off very, very early uh, and that, that's shown here and that has significant effect then on the grasses. So if we now look at the grasses um, you'll see how uh, different species here have responded. Um, uh, perennial ryegrass was 
uh, decreasing in the meadow that sort of thick that thick bright th uh, sorry that that uh, bright green line towards the bottom there that was declining um, common bent was declining in the meadow yorkshire fog was declining in the meadow this is all the effect of the, of the yellow rattle taking hold and, and, and bringing these species back into balance it's not about getting rid of them it's about bringing them back into balance and then you can clearly see there the effect without the yellow rattle this year uh, after the drought those grasses really really increased uh, and shot through the through the roof so they've bounced back it'll be really interesting to see what happens next year uh, how much yellow rattle germinates and how um, uh, how many uh, uh, sort of species respond how species respond to that to that this year the one plant that's bucked the trend I'll just point out a sweet fernal grass at the top there which is just sort of just you know is in joyous abandon in the uh, in, in in the meadow and it's one of my favorite grasses it's the little grass that gives meadows that gives hay that that lovely rich scent that 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 hay scent when it's cut uh it's got a chemical called cumarin in it uh and that's what's like say scents hay and when that's in flower you get a beautiful sort of vanilla scent off the meadows uh very early in spring when that's that when that's flowering so sweet vernal grass is doing really really well now, uh, diversity is made up of two things when, when we're looking at this in detail. So you've got the species richness, how many species are present in your field, but also their abundance, you know, how, 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 how dominant a species is. And what we're always aiming for is a lovely mixture of the two, lots of species, but no domination with one species or another. So these are, these are measured with indexes of diversity. There's lots of different indexes of diversity available, but I'm using Simpson index of diversity and you can see that over the years since 2015 uh, the diversity has slowly increased uh, well rapidly increased at the beginning slowly dipped off and then has picked up again so despite the drought the the, the actual measure of diversity has increased which is really really encouraging on the right hand side of the screen simpson's evenness that's a measure that's one of those elements that makes up the diversity looking at that in a little bit more detail you actually want this graph to be coming down and the sward to be less even so for example it's the difference between having a field with 20 species in it but 99 percent of the individuals are a yellow rattle uh, you don't want that domination by one species you want several uh, you want a nice and even mix of things and um, you can see here these two peaks so that 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 loss of evenness, if you like, uh, or domination by species was, was yellow rattle back in 2018. And then this year, we've had an increase in the grasses, particularly sweet vernal grass and other grasses as well, and also cats here, very tolerant to drought. That, that, that's really gone through the meadow and, uh, it, and, and caused a decrease in its, in its uh, evenness, which is uh, not something that we're looking for. So again, you know, we'll be looking, I'll be really fascinated to see what happens this next year uh, when, when uh, the new season and kicks off. So in terms of plants, we've had some really interesting plants starting to appear, and it's wonderful to see this different pattern of, em of emergence. So it took a couple of years before we started seeing Burnick saxifrage. The uh, year before last was the first year that, that we saw that. We've had uh, betony starting to flower now, a plant that takes a few years to get going and, and, and start appearing uh, in, in, any, in, in any quantity. Uh, and then other species, Tormentil and Devil's Bit Scabious, uh, starting to come through as well. Now, if you remember that slide of Moss Hill that I showed you with that sea of Devil's Bit Scabious, uh, I don't think we're going to replicate that in, in our meadow. Um, Devil's Bit Scabious is there and it flowers, but it's nowhere near the quantity that it is in, in the other meadow. And this is you know, to do with every meadow having its own identity, its own pulse, its own character. It's a, its own its own sort of mixture of species which makes it unique and special and um you know our our meadow is developing its own character and that's something that, that's wonderful to to, to watch we we're, we're not replicating uh, the original meadow we're just enjoying it develop into, into its own its own um uh, character and personality there's some other lovely species that have appeared that were not in the in the in the seed that came from the meadows at all uh lovely little knotted clover appeared last year uh which i was absolutely thrilled about because that's quite a rare species up in northwest wales uh so it's probably the rarest plant that's appeared by itself um, but also a common rest harrow, uh, not normally a meadow plant, but uh, you know we are next to the estuary here, and uh, it's a it's very much a, a you know a sort of uh, seaside species that you might expect to appear from the seed bank. 
Uh, and of course, the orchids are starting to arrive as well. I was absolutely thrilled that Common Spotted Orchid uh, has, has made its own appearance. Uh, we've got quite a few individuals in the meadow now. Um, early purple orchid in the middle there, uh, a few individuals in the hedge bank uh, before we started and they've moved out into the meadow. But the glory one uh, and the one that absolutely took my breath away uh, is Greater Butter Butterfly Orchid, which appeared last year and flowered last year. Now, I this was in the in in, in Moss Hill, um, but I did not expect it to flower so so quickly. So it's been an absolute revelation that that's come in uh, and and found its footing already. With all of this diversity of flowers, we get a diversity of pollinators. So all sorts of bees, carder bees, mining bees, solitary bees, honey bees, uh, bumblebees, all sorts of bees have been uh, photographed in, and, and recorded in the meadow now, which is a delight. And of course, all the butterflies as well. So we're starting to get a real catalogue of butterflies coming in. We had ringlets uh, last year, uh, and obviously that big influx of painted ladies coming in as well. Um, and of course, they're feeding off the food plants that are in the field as well as all, all the nectar. Um, but it's not just them, there are you know, lots of beetles and flies and other things that do pollination as well. Uh, <clears throat> these beautiful yellow spotted longhorn beetle here on the oxide daisy uh, and then things like thick legged flower beetle uh, at the top right, uh, marmalade hoverfly and even cockchafers which I've, I've filmed and, and photographed sort of pollinating cats here there. So all these beetles and other insects do their role for pollination and pollination has become a really interesting subject for me and a real passion of mine uh, trying to look at and understand that relationship between the different flowers in the meadow and their pollinators and what's this actually doing for pollinators so yeah this diversity of flowers are producing lots of different uh, uh, attractants for these pollinators they produce nectar uh, which is obviously fuel for life that's almost pure sugar but also pollen as well which is protein for growth and uh, lots of different flowers produce different amounts sorry different flowers produce different amounts of of nectar and pollen depending on their pollination strategy so here's just a little selection of plants from the meadow and you can see here how things like uh, knapweed uh, 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 produces a lot of pollen and a lot of, of nectar, oxide daisy by contrast, not much nectar but a huge amount of pollen and these are doing different things to attract different species in. So different plants do things differently and I've spent uh, uh, a whole year in the meadow back in 2019 plotting and monitoring uh, the flow of flowers as they come through uh, throughout the year. Different flowers coming and going in flux throughout the year. And this has allowed me to produce this graph, which I really, really love. Um, you can see how this is the quantity of flowers per quadrat per meter square throughout the year, starting with dandelion and then ribwort plantain, bulbous buttercup flowering, a huge spike in yellow rattle around uh, towards the end of May, then big spikes in the number of lesser trefoil and eye bright flowers all the way through to knapweed at the end that little spike of knapweed at the end and I don't think I had any well I didn't have any idea just how many flowers there would be in a meter square when I started this at the peak of flowering on the 26th of May there are 570 on average 570 flowers per meter square uh, the amount of counting that, that took was really quite extraordinary. It's not something that I'll ever, uh, ever repeat, but this is where I can extrapolate up this to the whole field um, and our three acre field uh, based on these results uh, at peak flowering gives 9 million flowers uh, at the at peak flowering at the end of May, begin, beginning of June, which is just a, an astonishing figure. Now that flux and flow of flowers, obviously they're producing different amounts of pollen and nectar. And this is uh, showing the nectar flow throughout the year. So you can see how important different plants are here, particularly things like uh, dandelion early in the year, red clover, and then cat's ear. And then this enormous spike at the end of year with knapweed, that very, very nectar rich flower producing a huge amount of nectar at the end of the year. 
So it's not just what's happening above ground that's important, but also what's happening below ground. And I think we've got to remember that as well as all this lovely pollination and the flowers that we're seeing above ground, there's all sorts of stuff happening below ground. Now, this is taken from uh, an, a study of, of prairie plants in North America. So this isn't, this isn't representative of, of my meadow, but it just gives you an idea of how different plants root at different depths, have different style of rooting and can access minerals and nutrients at different, different levels. And this is really, really important for all sorts of things within the meadow by bringing up different minerals and nutrients from different parts of the soil something called resource partitioning what we're actually finding is that these meadows these species rich meadows are more productive than uh, your traditional what's become your traditional uh, arable lay uh, uh, sorry uh, your species rich uh, sorry your traditional intensive pasture lay of, of, of perennial ryegrass and clover so this is the number of, rain, of, of, of round hay bales that have been produced from our field over time. And you'll see that the, you know, once we've got yellow rattle coming in, uh, there's a little dip in production, but that's really picked back up again. Um, so productivity can even can be maintained or even enhanced in these meadows. And this is true of many published studies now. There, there's a whole raft of studies coming out showing that the, 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 the above ground productivity is not just only maintained, but can be enhanced in these species rich meadows. So that old belief that yellow rattle is really bad and these, uh, these, these grasslands are unproductive um, is absolutely wrong. And, and we really need to challenge that. They're really, really productive. Not only that, um, those roots underground, that diagram of those roots underground are tapping into nitrogen in lots of different ways. So they're utilizing nitrogen much more effectively than just two species in, you know, you think of a ryegrass and, and clover lay, all of the roots at the top of the soil. Uh, but when you've, you've got all that different routing down at different depths, that's bringing up lots more nitrogen. It's using it much more effectively and um, you get less leaching of nitrogen out into the environment and, and you reduce the need for fertilizers as, as, as well. So there's, there's huge two environmental huge benefits there uh, that come from this species richness. Uh, and there's a lot of studies now showing that there's improved carbon sequestration and it's quite interesting there's a lot of farmers around the country now who are looking at their carbon balances as they convert species poor grassland to species rich grassland and that it, that huge increase in carbon sequestration um, figures vary from uh, around three to four tons of co2 per hectare per year below ground storage I've recently seen figures from, from the Lake District of, of, of eight tonnes uh, of CO2 per hectare per year. Now, this won't be maintained in the long term. This is just at the initial stage of this um, conversion. Uh, but again, some rough back of the envelope uh, calculations so that we've got uh, our meadow you know, below ground storage of, of 35 tonnes of CO2, which is absolutely fantastic. Obviously, that above ground storage, that's going into hay. So that will be used and, and probably released back to the atmosphere in a different way, but that below ground storage uh, of CO2 is really important and underlines the importance of a, of a, a multi-habitat approach that we need to carbon storage. And there's benefits for, for, for our livestock. So you know, a species rich diet leads to increased mineral uptake. Those roots down below ground are bringing up different minerals from different areas. And there's evidence that there's a reduced need for mineral licks uh, with, 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 with uh, livestock that's grazed on these species rich pastures. Also self-medication, you know, these plants are very, very rich in all sorts of different chemical compounds. And there's good evidence that some of the tannins, it's like what you find in, um, uh, the birds for trefoil act as a natural helminthicide, reducing the need for intestinal worm treat, intestinal worm treatment. So you know, literally cut down on your vet's bills uh, and the need to uh, uh, provide your, your 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 livestock with with minerals. There's an old adage that you are what you eat eats you know and and again there's new evidence coming out that uh, you know this is a really high quality if you're grazing on a species rich grassland you're getting a really high quality um, uh, product at the end of it with with your beef and your milk with lots of benefits for us as well passing on things particularly things like uh, amino acids in into our health into our diet um one of the other benefits for us is has been for me has been 
uh, on this personal journey, um, uh, linking back into uh, uh, my farming roots, uh, all, you know, although it's in a small way, uh, and not only uh, owning cattle, but rearing our own cattle as well. And this is Nell, uh, our little baby calf that was born a couple of years ago, um, and really linking into that whole community of farmers in the local farming community has been an absolute pleasure for us. Um, you know, there's really some support network there. People are fascinated with what we're doing and it's really interesting to uh, show that to people. So that connection with the farming community has, has been one of the biggest rewards for me and an unexpected reward of, of, of taking this journey. And as I mentioned there, showing this med meadow um, and how it's developing to people is one of my greatest joys. I'm, I must say, I do, I, I love showing people the meadow. Um, and this is a visit by, from the North Wales uh, Meadows Group, a uh, group of enthusiasts, farmers, uh, locals, and, and people interested in wildlife who are keen to create their own wildflower meadows. I will always be uh, happy and willing and, and very keen to show people how it's done and, 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 and what needs to be done. Uh, and new audience as well so we actually had a, a visit from the the highland cattle club of wales um and uh yeah they're they're, they're really uh, uh enthusiastic about giving their animals a, a really good good diet and, and keeping them well so the last few slides before we finish um a Above all, the biggest pleasure has been the chance for me to watch this meadow grow uh, and develop, taking on its own character and its own identity and just having really those quiet moments to reflect on, on just the sheer joy and the sheer beauty of these plants and the wildlife that have now found their home there. Um, last spring during the lockdown, uh, you know, people weren't able to come to the meadow, which was, which was a real shame. Uh, but I posted a series of, of little meadow meditations uh, on Twitter, uh, just little still snapshots, still videos um, or locked off videos of, of just moments in the meadow with birdsong in the background and, and these flowers and pollinators doing these, these things. And, and that was really, really, really uh, popular and struck a chord with people. You know, what was a really difficult time for, for all of us and still is uh, a little bit of meadow meditation. Uh, uh, really, really to provide a, 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 a solace in nature and a, and a natural tonic. And at Plant Life, you know, we've been leading several large meadow projects since 2013. Uh, and together, these have seen the creation and restoration of over 12,000 acres of, of meadow and species rich grassland. Uh, really excitingly, uh, we've just secured a grant through the government's Green Recovery Challenge Fund uh, for a new project called Meadow Makers, which will see another 1,200 acres of meadow created across seven counties in England. The most exciting element, I think, for me of this project is that we'll be training six meadow apprentices uh, to learn the skills and gain experience in creating meadows so they will go on to be uh, the meadow makers of the future. So I just want to leave you and say thank you with this slide. Most of all, this thing has shown me, and the biggest surprise to me has been how quickly the flowers and the wildlife can return. You know, this is, this is after five years. If we just give them the opportunity and provide them with the management that they need, you too can get nine million flowers appearing in five years. Uh, and nothing could bring more joy to the heart and hope for the future uh, in the face of, of, of you know, the biodiversity lost from the countryside it can be done we can bring these things back and 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 uh, i hope uh, everybody's enjoyed the talk and uh, thank you very much so i'll just finish sharing my screen now and uh, we'll come back to brilliant thank you so much trevor that was a fascinating talk and it was Wonderful to hear about all of the wonderful flowers in your meadow, but also your, your personal journey through it. And on that note, we've had so many questions in, um, which, which, is, which is wonderful. Um, I'm afraid I couldn't question. see the chat as we were going, so <laughs> I do apologize. Um, <laughs> one of the questions, perhaps to start us off, um, why did you decide to become a botanist and not a, and not a farmer, um, <laughs> given, given your background? <laughs> So I, ha I have an older brother and a twin brother, both of whom are in, in farming. So I thought that, that was enough ah. people in farming. So, uh, so I, I steered off into, into, into plants. For some reason, you know, plants just captured my imagination as I was really, really young. I, I remember the moment that I discovered an early purple orchid growing on the farm. And um, that was the moment that, that 
that I remember going to the bookshop with my mum and buying a book to show to work out what this plant was and that just fired up my imagination for, for that so but I think that that progression through my life of of of, of, of understanding farming uh, along with the botany and the ecology and, and, and that conservation gives gives a you know, slightly different different take on 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 conservation going forward which has been really useful for me in in, in my that's career wonderful that's brilliant uh, a few people had questions on the sort of the best timings to cut the hay and to sow the seeds and and whether yeah. you did anything to increase the contact of the seeds with the ground or did you just let them do their thing no we, we just let them do their thing some people well what we did do was 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 we put the livestock straight into the field um and like so we we actually put in a few sheep as well uh and that helps just trample the seed down into the soil um you don't have to do that as long as you get a little bit of rain the seed will work its way down into the soil but it can help um timings of hay cut is really interesting um and what i would say is that there's no one set prescription and in fact it's a really good thing to do slightly different things each year um, we vary it it depends on the weather we vary it uh, all the way from the end of July through to September depending on the on the weather this year in fact the weather was so bad at the end of summer we abandoned a hay cut I was going to include this in the talk but I didn't have time um, we didn't do a hay cut we've just put the cattle into the field as a standing crop of vegetation back in September and they've done frankly a brilliant job of taking the grass down over the last few months uh, and getting us to where we want to be at this time of year. It looks superb. So it's called Foggage. Uh, there's a little blog on the Plant Life website about, about Foggage, and I'll do a little update on how it's doing. But um, you know, go by the weather, leave it as late as you can, because obviously you get lots of lots more seed set then. So if you can go into end of August, beginning of September, that's great. Um, but yeah, don't get too worried about about um, the other thing with foggage, I should just say is, is you know, um, the hay cut is a very harsh operation. You know, I'm, I'm aware of that. You know, overnight, over, over, you know, in the course of an hour, your meadow is reduced to uh, cut grass and that can have a big impact on invertebrate pop populations. So I'm really keen to see how this foggage works this year um, because a lot of that standing vegetation is still there and it's a bit sort of messed up and the invertebrates really, really love that. So I'm be interested to see how it responds next year. Brilliant. And and talking of, of grazers and equipment, uh, lots of people have obviously been been inspired by your wonderful Highland cows. But um, what sort of what other livestock work well or if you don't have um, uh, a wonderful Highland cow or any other type of grazer, can you, can you replicate um, this meadow management with 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 mowers and, and the type of equipment? Yeah, absolutely. So in, in terms of the livestock, you know, that was the big revelation working with the um, Rare Breed Survival Trust. Um, you know, these native ancient breeds are adapted to thrive really well on this slightly coarser vegetation. Uh, you know, like I say, our cattle are complete barrels in this, but I know the owners in the past have had charolais on this land and they didn't thrive at all. So, you know, our native breeds are bred for this. Belted Galloways are excellent, um, uh, really used popularly for, for grazing, but also the, you know, the sheep, um, uh, you know, we have, we've had rylands grazing on here, ancient sheep breed or native sheep breeds. They're they're really really good for this as well I really would because they're hardy and they're adaptable you yeah, know they tend to have fewer problems uh, they're easier to look after and they're, they're, they're adapted to, to thrive on this if you haven't got a highland cow uh, I'd, I'd really recommend it <laughs> it's one of the top things you can do but a bit of cow meditation never goes 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 <laughs> amiss um then um, you can come in and do another hay cut, you can do another mow. So if you, if you do a hay cut and remove that vegetation, you can come in and do another mow before Christmas, maybe two if the weather conditions allow it. Um, just topping that, that material off and, 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 and keeping that under control, that's another way of doing it as, as well. And of course, there are systems, you, you can perfectly have a, a very, very good wildflower meadow without any hay cutting at all. So if you haven't got the equipment, then just using uh, grazing and getting the grazing right at the right time that's another way of do, doing it as well and, and that works really really well yeah brilliant that's great to know now I know we're a few minutes over time but there were a few other questions that I, I wanted to ask because um, they've come in and they're very popular ones so the first one um, if you don't have acres to work with can you replicate this in <laughs> yes. your back garden or your front uh, garden or 
yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely, yeah. And and I think you know, given the scale of wildflower meadow loss, uh, to coin uh, a popular phrase, every little helps. You know, uh, and I have uh, ha have a garden with a with a square meter of wildflower meadow sort of established in it. That square meter is an extra square meter that doesn't exist in the countryside. These things are brilliant habitats for attracting wildlife into your into your garden. You know, as soon as you have some wildflower meadow. Yeah, if anybody wants to attract wildlife into the garden, I would say uh, get a wildflower. Stop mowing your lawn, basically. Um, uh, and if people want to find out more about that, we've got another seminar, another webinar in, in a couple of weeks' time looking at every flower counts, which is all about how to mow your lawn and how to get lots of flowers into your lawn. Um, so it's very, very easy to create these wildflower meadows in your, in your, in your gardens, and, and I'd, I'd thoroughly recommend doing that. Again, you might not fit a highland cow into your garden, but a lawnmower can do the same. <laughs> Job and, and, and a strimmer, so uh, there, there are ways of doing it without Highland cows. Wonderful, that's fantastic to know. Um, and the last one, sort of picking up on on the trends that you were showing in your meadow, especially with droughts perhaps likely to increase, or just the sort of plants that you you might see come and go in your meadow. What what are you plan? What are your plans for the future? Yeah, I think I mean my plans for the future are to to carry on with that with that cycle of meadow management and see how this thing evolves and just let it be itself and and develop itself. It I think it's really interesting that I think one of the main impacts that we're going to see from climate change, um, rather than an increase in temperature, are these spring droughts and they're going to have a big impact on 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 our flora um, uh, much more substantially than than the rises in temperature. These spring droughts have big effects. You know. Potentially, we've lost a lot of yellow rattle from the meadow this year. I'm going to be really interested to see how much germinates in, in, in the spring. It'll come back, but just what those quantities. But it's very interesting to compare our fields with our neighbours' fields uh, at the height of the drought. You know, we had lots of cats here. We had lots of knapweed. We had lots of deep-rooted species. Red clover is very deep-rooted. You know, all of these things were tapping into that water below ground and flowering and, and growing, whereas our neighbours' fields with ryegrass and, and, and white clover, which is very shallow rooted, were dying off. So, you know, I think this sort of thing in a changing climate, there are big, big advantages to it, to maintaining that productivity in, in a changing climate. So it's just going to be very interesting to, to, to see what happens. Yeah. But this, you know, the joy of these, these meadows is that these new species arrive every year. And you, know, you don't have to do any more to them. You're just providing them, once you've bought that seed in initially, the real joy of them is just to step back and see these new plants moving in and turning this place in, these places in, into their home. Brilliant. That's fantastic to hear. And I, I think all of us will look forward to, to joining you again in future years to, to hear how your meadow is going then as well. So thank you so much, Trevor. And there's lots of thanks coming in on the chat for, for such an inspirational talk. So it's, it's been so an much. absolute joy and I hope people have enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, I will uh, keep an eye on our social media channels and, and, and have a look on, on uh, follow me on Twitter and I'll be tweeting from the meadow all year long. <laughs> so uh, I'll share it with everybody whilst, whilst we're in lockdown. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you everybody for joining us today. And I think now we're just about over. That's a, a wonderful point to wrap it up. So thank you again, Trevor. It's wonderful. Thank you. That no, was a pleasure. Thank you.